What's on your mind, old friend? Nuclear proliferation. Jesus! And people say I'm bad at parties. I thought you were optimistic. Why do you assume nuclear proliferation isn't a good thing? Uh, because I don't want the world to end in a nuclear holocaust? Isn't that enough? I'm sure I could think of something else, but that should be enough. Do you have any data to support that idea? Sure. In 2009, the total yield of all known nuclear weapons was 6.4 gigatons of TNT. If we assume that's evenly distributed across 6,400 one-megaton bombs, and that those bombs will be detonated at an altitude of two kilometers, we have enough nuclear weapons to nuke the entire world four times. So, yeah, I predict a dire outcome. By my math, we can only destroy 50% of the Earth with nuclear weapons. My number is for the area in which all buildings would be destroyed. Your number is for the area in which all buildings would be damaged. I guess this just proves how soft I am. I get all upset at the thought of buildings being damaged and people getting first-degree burns and, uh... Oh, right. I almost forgot. The apocalypse. Believe it or not, I agree with you that ever using these weapons would be a bad thing. But please, tell me. When was the last time a nuclear weapon was used in anger? August 9th, 1945. Right. It's been 70 years since anyone has launched a nuclear attack for one simple reason. Nuclear weapons guarantee peace. That didn't sound quite right. I think you should try saying that again, but this time while doing a Dr. Strangelove impression. Snicker all you like, but the data is irrefutable. There has never been a war between two nuclear states. You're pretentious enough to know Latin, right? Post hoc ergo propter hoc. There are numerous causes for the abatement of wars in the nuclear age without resorting to the eponymous weapons. Popular theories include the proliferation of democracies, the increase in economic interdependence, the decrease in scarcity of essential goods, and the growing importance of international institutions such as the United Nations. Good point. When the United Nations wants to prevent a war, there's no war. That's why the United States never invaded Iraq in 2003. Snicker all you like. But the trend is unmistakable. I think those explanations for the gradual decline in interstate wars are perfectly fine in general, but none of them explain why the United States and the communist powers never went to war, and that non-event needs explaining. Immediately after defeating Nazi Germany, the British drafted Operation Unthinkable with the explicit goal to impose upon Russia the will of the United States and the British Empire. General George Patton was an outspoken advocate of an immediate invasion of the Soviet Union and ominously predicted, someday we will have to fight them and it will take six years and cost us six million lives. In 1946, George F. Kennan's long telegram explained how the Soviet Union saw itself as engaged in a perpetual war against capitalism and was sensitive only to shows of force. The obverse of the long telegram was the Novikov telegram, in which Nikolai Novikov and Vyacheslav Molotov explained how the United States was preparing the conditions for winning world supremacy in a new war. Frustrated with setbacks in the Korean War, General MacArthur wanted to expand it into a full-fledged war against China. His advocacy for this eventually caused Truman to relieve him of his command. Right. Tensions in the Cold War were higher than Rush Limbaugh in the Dominican Republic. But tense international relations are historically normal and don't inevitably lead to wars. Are there any primary documents in which a powerful military or political leader explicitly says we would definitely attack the Soviet Union right now, but we can't because of nuclear weapons? Of course not. Your standard of proof is higher than Bill Maher on the International Space Station. No sane diplomat would commit something like that to writing. But the evidence is, nonetheless, extremely compelling. There was an international communist movement willing to use force to promote communism, and we saw that in the Eastern Bloc, Korea, and Afghanistan. There was also an international capitalist movement willing to use force to promote capitalism, and we saw that in Korea, Vietnam, and South America. And yet, that willingness to use force never resulted in direct military action against another nuclear power. It seems self-evident that the nuclear weapons of the great powers prevented direct military action against them. Fine. Let's say your strange Lovian scheme of mutually assured destruction works, in theory. In practice, I see some real flaws. During the Cuban Missile Crisis, the captain of a Soviet submarine ordered an attack on a U.S. flotilla using a nuclear weapon.
That kind of attack required the concurrence of the political officer and the second-in-command before it could be carried out. The political officer concurred, but, thankfully for the world, the second-in-command, a hero named Vasily Alexandrovich Arkhipov, refused. If not for this one man, we would have been in a nuclear war. That one man was operating as part of a system. Precisely because the consequences of nuclear weapons are so dire, significant structural safeguards are implemented. The consent of three officers was needed for a nuclear attack precisely to create as many opportunities as possible to prevent one. You call that a close call. I call it the system working. So, you're putting your faith in systems? Does that include early warning systems, like the one installed at NORAD which raised a false alarm in 1979 that nearly initiated an erroneous retaliatory strike? Or the Soviet OCO program, which nearly initiated an erroneous retaliatory strike against the U.S. in 1983 if not for the sound judgment of unsung hero Stanislav Petrov, who insisted the indications of a U.S. nuclear attack were a false alarm? See, as entertaining as Dr. Strangelove is, it gets something very important very wrong. It's unthinkable to have a fully automated nuclear response system. Human judgment is an essential part of any system governing the use of nuclear weapons. I'm sure the ten minutes or so those false alarms lasted were more stressful than people would have liked, but there was no nuclear war. The system ultimately worked, because it incorporated human judgment. What about the terrifying track record of broken arrows, often caused by human error? Since 1950, there have been 32 documented incidents in which a nuclear weapon was accidentally launched, detonated, or lost. How many civilian casualties resulted from those broken arrows? As far as I know, zero. And how many civilians would have died in a full-scale war between the United States and the Soviet Union? Or the United States and China? Tens of millions? Hundreds of millions? The point isn't the damage the mishandling of nuclear weapons has done. The point is the danger it represents. Considering we have a sample size of 32, and there has been no noticeable damage, why do you think there's a danger? Because it only takes one mistake to kill tens of thousands. But that's why we have all the safeguards in place. By my math, counting up all zero civilian casualties, the safeguards are working. There's no reason to expect we will make enough simultaneous mistakes to allow all safeguards to fail. What's the disclaimer you need to put on all your financial services sales literature? Past performance is no guarantee of future performance. That seems applicable here. Okay, let's assume that, sometime in the next 50 years, there's an unsanctioned detonation of a nuclear weapon in a populated area. That would kill tens of thousands of people. Compared to the millions who would have died in another world war, I'm still comfortable with that. You're really being blasé about tens of thousands of deaths? Only compared to my concern about the tens of millions of deaths which would occur in another world war. But there's still no conclusive proof that nuclear weapons prevent war. Right. But the circumstantial evidence is compelling. In spite of numerous pressures to do so, nuclear powers have never gone to war against each other. What does that matter when the consequences of a mistake are so dire? What about the consequences of eliminating nuclear weapons? If they have prevented war, the consequences of eliminating them would be much more terrible than an unsanctioned detonation. Just so we're clear, I'm getting the impression that you think we could eliminate interstate wars by giving every country nuclear weapons. There's an argument to be made that a country which is unable to build their own arsenal from scratch isn't developed enough to have earned them, but certainly no country should be prevented from building them. And you're not worried that an unstable ruler would use them? Or let them fall into the hands of terrorists? Not really. Pakistan and North Korea are hardly examples of fully functioning states, and neither has ever used their nuclear weapons. Honestly, I think those failing states might make my best argument. North Korea is a state which clearly has regard for neither its own citizens nor the international community, and yet it doesn't use its nuclear weapons. Pakistan is rife with internal instability, and its nuclear weapons have never fallen out of the government's hands. I guess I just feel like we can't assume there won't be a disaster just because there hasn't been one yet. Honestly, that's a good feeling to have. Your concern breeds the vigilance which is necessary for the safekeeping of these weapons. Really, we're on the same side. Did you really just use my opposition to your argument as evidence that your argument is correct? 
That's some impressive rhetorical jujitsu, don't you think? I'm leaving now. Try not to destroy the world before the next time we get together. Buttressed by your vigilance, how could I fail?